Hey everybody, this is Perch, and this is kind of this weird, awkward middle video. Um, and I wanted to talk about some of the methodology, some of the things I'm doing for the videos and the site, somewhere I'm coming from. This would probably be better as a disclaimer, but uh, be before every video, or not not every video, but the videos that do this. But it, it then you're, you know, then I'm kind of repeating the same thing over and over again. This may be just me, and and I understand this. This this channel is not conventional. I, I mean, just if I could take a step back here for a second. I am doing this as a hobby, as fun. And I, I hope that, that that kind of everybody sees that. Um, it is, I'm not trying to become YouTube rich. I don't even think such a thing is really possible. Uh, this is in some ways a stalling game until you know the, the shop is opened up again. I can have conversations with everybody and we can kind of do it that way. Um, definitely you're gonna see when the shop's all open, when things kind of return to quote unquote normal. Um, I think for this channel, you'll probably see several weeks of either off time or I'm putting out a bunch of older videos just to kind of give myself some breathing room. And then what's going to happen is you're going to see a lot more live in person type stuff. That's my hope anyway. Maybe this never happens. Maybe, you know, I never get there. But the hope is that some of these conversations can happen that way. The Friday live streams can be, you know, some folks in the shop chatting uh, in more of a, you know, that kind of format. That's I'd like to play with that. Now, a lot of people will tell you that that is not how you, again, gain hundreds of thousands of subscribers. But again, and I don't say this out of false modesty, I promise. It's not, I'm not doing that humble brag thing. Um, I don't, I, I, I never expected to get the subs that I have. I'm very thankful to everyone who has, and I hope you're getting some good value and entertainment, more entertainment than anything else out of it. But I didn't set out to do this. I didn't set out to grow a YouTube channel. That was, it was a happy accident because I'm just doing what I enjoy. And, and that's that's the point. So a lot of things I do are not the smart things to do if you're trying to drive a channel. You know, I, I'm I'm trying to play. I'm trying to I'm a technologist at heart. So I also like to learn kind of along the way. So you see a lot of experiments and things I do. Uh, I'm fascinated by metrics, as you can probably tell from the sales anal the analysis videos. So I've been toying with uh, you turn advertising on with this one and not on with this one. And you change the things around and then watch how YouTube distributes that thing. I'm just trying to learn a little bit about what's going on in the background for YouTube, so I'm fascinated by, by that. Uh, but in general, this is just for fun. So again, I don't do everything right. I think there's a lot of, uh, I don't do many things right for that matter. I just try to, to, to experiment. So a lot of things that I think would be smarter for me to do, I'm kind of learning as I go. If you'll notice with those sales videos that I put out, they're, they're getting better refined each time. I'm either adding more data, or I'm finding different ways to visualize it, and that's kind of the fun of putting all this stuff together. I also think if you've been listening to the retrospectives, which are truly one of the most fun things that I do on here, uh, those as well. You'll, you'll see how they're they're evolving slowly and and putting those things together. At the same time, you know, I'm also I have some consulting work. I have a lot of other things going on, working on my comic, and and the most important job trying to be dad. So that's that's always going to take priority. Uh, some people have asked for more of the kids on the channel. Um, I will put the kids on the channel. I will say that. Uh, Family got spooked a little bit with some of the mail I got that uh, was pretty, uh, pretty hostile. I would say, <laughs> so uh, that's given me at least some pause. I I, I don't uh, want my kids exposed to that, which I'm sure everybody could understand. But a couple things to kind of throw out there for for people as kind of a recap summary. So first off, um, because these questions have come up, so let me just answer them here. When I'm doing these sales numbers, what does that mean? Who's buying? And uh, this is, again, this may be a good disclaimer. I'll try and figure out a good way to maybe just put a single image at the beginning so people can remember the ground rules, but these are sales to comic shops. But uh, a lot of people will say, aha, that's a gotcha, um, because this isn't tracking who's actually selling to customers. But as I mentioned before, uh, it's not as far off as you think. And the reason being is comic shops just do not have the overhead to buy like 20,000 extra copies of something that they can't sell. They would go out of business very, very rapidly. The comic shops have evolved, and I can say this is true for everyone, including even places like Midtown. Uh, they are buying what they think they can sell. Now, there may be some different math around it. I think I, I heard once upon a time from uh, one of the, the owners over at Midtown that they tried to do 80% sell through and 20% back stock. So they were selling, they're basically ordering 20% more than what they could sell the month of in order to have some back stock. And that's a strategy, but nobody is ordering like on purpose, you know, twice as much as they can sell. Nobody is doing that. So the numbers are not as inflated as you think. Now it does absolutely happen that comic shops wind up with stacks of comics they can't sell. That does happen. 
And that's a result of one of two things. Either the comic shop has, uh, you know, messed up and overordered, uh, which they're not going to continually do. That's why when you look at these sales analysis numbers, it's good to look at the trend line or the whole group of comics because any comic shop can make a mistake or they can get suckered in by marketing or, or there's lots of reasons why a single issue might abnormally bump up. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, comics, the, you know, the, the runs tend to work themselves out. Nobody order, over orders double of a comic uh, for a year. Again, they would, they would go out of business. They just don't have that kind of capital floating around. So that's why it's important to look at the big picture. And anytime you look at one tiny single source of data, one single point, it tends to be misleading. Um, the other reason why you might have big stacks of comics on the shelf is because of something that I've gotten some questions about, and that's overshipping. So to kind of briefly summarize, what's overshipping? Well, I have a full video on this. You can, you can search uh, overshipping on my channel and you'll come to it. Uh, but basically, it's where you as a comic shop order 30 copies and say Marvel sends you 60. And why, you know, first off, you don't pay for the extra 30. You pay for the 30 you ordered. The 30 you get are quote unquote free. Now, why I say quote unquote is because you do pay for the shipping. But the shipping cost is is pretty tiny. I, I had got a big argument with somebody once like they're killing you with shipping costs. And it's like, well, let me run the math for you. Yeah, it costs you an extra 28 cents to get that, that additional 10 copies of Iceman. Now, to be fair, you know, uh, comic shops are, you know, some are not happy at paying an extra 28 cents. I mean, and, and why would you? You're paying for something you didn't order. I get it. But it's, it's very small. And in all cases, you could take those books, and a lot of people do. You can walk right down the street to like a half price books, and you can unload them all and get your money back very quickly, and then some. But the bigger question is, why do publishers do this? And they do this for marketing. This is purely about marketing. It's saying, what the publisher is saying is like, hey, we want to get more interest in Miss Marvel. So we know that we see that the interest from the retailers, from the comic shops, is 20,000 copies of this issue. But we're introducing a new character. It's the start of a new arc. Um, it's, it's, we're, it's a jumping on point. So what we're going to do is we're going to overship it. We're going to send comic shops more than what they asked for at our expense, again, other than the shipping. And this is going to basically push the shop to promote this comic. So they have more things that they could sell and they'll get a higher margin on it. And so this will ultimately lead people to pick up the comic and we think there's a good hook in there. So they'll come back the next month for more issues and it, it, it grows the audience. That's the theory. And sometimes it has worked out that way. But um, more often than not, uh, it's, that is a, it's, it's a decent idea. The overshipping and the marketing is a good idea, but it needs to be followed up with the other half of the picture, which is, okay, if you, you know, it's like fishing. If you hook the fish, that's great, but you got to reel it in. So this is a case where a Marvel or a DC needs to also do additional marketing on that issue themselves to say, hey, make sure you go pick up this issue at the comic shop because it's starting off a brand new six issue arc and you're really going to want it. They need to do that piece. And it feels like the company gets exhausted. They do the overship and then they promptly forget about what's going on and they kind of wander away and it's over at that point. And so that's where it's, it's you know, it isn't really successful. The only dodgy part about overships, and I, I agree this is dodgy, and this is what a lot of people do uh, kind of hook on to, is... Marvel then rolls the overship into the sales numbers. So in the past, when Marvel has wanted to kind of, I keep saying Marvel, but they've used this practice a lot more, when they've wanted to beat DC for the month, they wanted to show that they were selling more in units shipped and dollars sold. Now keep in mind, this is where unit shipped is say Marvel sending 20,000 copies of Captain Marvel to a shop. Dollars is how much was actually paid for. And those numbers are slightly different. And they're, they're, there's other differences there around, you know, the cover price. Like, you know, you might have 100,000 copies of a $3.99 comic go out. But the 50,000 copies you sold of a $10 comic actually is, is you know, it beats, it beats things in dollar share. I hope this makes sense. It, because it costs more, so therefore you're collecting more money. So overships don't count to dollar share because the publishers aren't collecting money. It's it net effect zero. But it does impact units. So this is where Marvel at times has said, see, all of our books are in the top 10. We own that. But half of those books were overshipped. So they, they basically faked their way into that top 10. 
Now, the, the silliness about this is nobody really cares. Like certainly nobody at Disney or AT&T now are going, well, let's see, how are you doing on the uh, diamond shipping numbers? Nobody is, nobody cares. None of the executives uh, matter. And in fact, I've heard from people at Marvel said when we, when you push those numbers up, nobody seems to care. And of course not. They're, they're, they're going to care about raw profits. They're not going to care about how you performed on the diamond sales chart. But that's, that's where um, people have pointed out the dodginess of unit shift. It's, it's where Marvel's made announcements of, you know, this comic, uh, you know, Iceman was a top 50 book. It's like, well, it was a top 50 book in unit shift because you overshipped it. So it wasn't really a top 50 book. It was actually much further down than that. But you overshipped the book to get it into this, this place. And it's, it's a fake award. So it, it doesn't matter anyway. Nobody cares about this stuff. So that's, that's how kind of overships come out and what the complexity is around all that. At any rate, these are important details to remember when you're looking at those sales analysis videos. I try to point out when overships happen. The last thing to kind of go over, and I'll, I'll just say this again very quickly, there is a full video on this, um, and I, I, I've got enough questions, I probably should do another one, which is, uh, what is the newsstand and returnability? So in the 30 seconds or less version, the newsstand is when comics are sold in the grocery store and in the gas stations and places like that. And the comics that were sold through the newsstand had what they call was returnability. So after a month's time or some time limit, the grocery store could take the comics that didn't sell, they could rip the covers off of them to prove that they were no longer sellable, and then send the covers back to basically the, the publisher and get a, a refund, get the money back. And this was designed, this is what the magazine industry, lots of people do. And it's, it's called just getting lots of volume of your, your periodicals out there. Most magazine publishers like this process and why they do it is because then they sell advertising in those books against the circulation rate. They, they're basically able to go to advertisers and say, we're shipping a million copies of this thing out. What they don't need to say is, yeah, of the million copies, 800,000 are coming back to us. That, that part doesn't matter to the advertisers. They're just getting the initial circulation rate out. And today, the newsstand doesn't exist for comics. It's, the, it's what they call the direct market, which is basically sold just through comic shops. A lot of complexity there. Again, there's a full video. But the challenge is, especially with the, uh, you know, when I do the sales numbers, is there are not accurate newsstand numbers out there. Uh, we don't have them. We don't know really what they are. And by accuracy, we, in most cases, we don't know what was shipped to the newsstand. And we also don't know what was returned. So I could come on here and say, hey, this, uh, this issue of Miss Marvel from the, the late 70s sold 250,000 copies through the newsstand, which is probably, probably about right, probably about what was sold. But what I can't tell you is of that 250,000, what was returned? Um, just anecdotally, at the newsstand, uh, a large number of comics were returned like somewhere north of, you know, 70% of the comics would actually come back. And, and so that's why it's, it's a very dodgy number. It's actually more meaningful of a discussion than the comic shop one of what, what did the comic shop order versus what did customers actually buy? That, that number is, is quite close by the nature of that business. But at the newsstand, it's, it's actually quite far apart. Like half the books were getting pulped. Pulp being that practice of ripping the cover off. So I'll end this by saying, if you ever go to a flea market, if such things exist anymore, or you find a box of comics and you see a bunch of comics where there's the cover is missing, what happened there is that somebody uh, was friends with whoever worked at their local you know, grocery store or just hung out in the garbage. Uh, and they basically would get boxes of comics where after the cover had been torn off, they would take those, uh, you know, those coverless comics and, and take them home uh, for free. That's, that's usually what happened. And in many cases, you know, a lot of places would just, you know, put a box of coverless comics out behind the, the, you know, their store and let whoever wanted to take them, take them. That, that was how things were in the 80s. It was a crazy time. Anyway, uh, a lot of detail in all this, but as a high level overview, that's, that's kind of some things to keep in mind. Again, kind of a boring video. Just wanted to put that out there. I've gotten enough questions about that. It was just easier to jump on the microphone and quickly answer them. So there you go. Hopefully this was uh, useful and informative and, um, and there you have it. Anyway, looking forward to doing more videos for you. Like and subscribe, blah, blah, blah. S go to social media to follow me if you feel like it. Send me an email. I'm going to go through my email tomorrow and actually answer it, which is an amazing thing. Uh, but most importantly of all, thanks for listening.